All right. So without further ado, I will introduce our phenomenal speaker, Dr. Josephine Wee. Um, so Dr. Wee joined the Department of Food Science um, at Penn State as an assistant professor in 2018. Um, she's just been a, an astoundingly powerful champion for alternative proteins since then. Um, she has a bachelor's in food science and a dual PhD in food science and environmental toxicology from Miss Michigan State. Dr. Wee also conducted her postdoc fellowship in yeast evolutionary biology at Cornell. And right now her team at Penn State uses genomics and molecular biology to more deeply understand the role that fungi plays in food safety, quality, and sustainability. Um, most recently, Dr. Wee has been seeking to develop and characterize fungal mycelium as a potential scaffolding material for cultivated meat, um, and that's one of the main applications we'll be learning about today. Um, so, obviously, fungi has this incredibly long history of safe use in food and food production. Um, fungi, like molds and mushrooms, um, transport nutrients and decompose organic matter using a network of filaments known as mycelium. Um, and food associated fungi can be used for fermentation derived biomass, um, for the production of single cell proteins, and for the use of scaffolds for cultivated meat. And we're just really beginning to tap into the potential of microbial fermentation and fungi um, as. Uh, as production platforms for um, the next generation of alternative protein innovations. So I'm really thrilled to have you here today, Joe. Um, and you can go ahead and share your screen when you're ready. Um, All right. To, yeah, lead us into our seminar today. Thank you for taking Thank you, Amy. Mm -hmm. All right. Can everyone hear me and see my screen? I guess not everyone, but just Amy <laughs> for now. <laughs> Are we, are we live? We're okay? Can you see my screen? Looks great. Looks great. Awesome. All right. Good morning. Good afternoon, evening to everyone. Um, I hope you're safe and well wherever you are. Um, before I begin, I just wanted to give a shout out to the Good Food Institute for the opportunity to um, share some of the work we're doing at Penn State Food Science with you today. Um, they have been an incredible support um, um, for earlier career investigators like I, um, like me. GFI has provided a really, I would like to think a low barrier accessible platform um, that is inclusive and welcoming to discuss how we can advance um, the science of alternative proteins um, together. So I have two screens, I'm glancing back and forth, so I apologize if I might be looking away. Um, thank you everyone for taking the time out of your day for yet another virtual seminar. Um, here we are after a year still in a virtual space. Um, I appreciate you and your time and I hope that by the end of this seminar, you um, will be ex as excited as I am about the micro possibilities um, where we are hopeful of a future where fungi will continue to be a significant and major source of protein in our diets, as well as um, their use in food ingredients and in various food applications. So uh, before I move on, I saw um, all the amazing locations in the world um, that uh, um, our attendees are from. Uh, I thought I would share a little bit of where I'm from. Uh, I'm from a little, a little country in Southeast Asia, a little small town in Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia has a population of about 30 million. Um, I received my bachelor's of science uh, from Michigan State University, as well as a dual PhD in food science and environmental toxicology. Um, then went on to Cornell to conduct my postdoctoral fellowship, um, where I studied the role of non-coding RNA um, in, in yeast, um, the ability of yeast to ferment and uh, conduct respiration. In 2018, I started uh, my research group at Penn State, where um, we are interested in all things fungi um, at Michigan, uh, sorry, at Penn State. I'm an assistant professor of food science. Um, my mother thinks that I assist the professor, but um, that's a story for another day. Um, this is our food science building, uh, where the research, education, extension, and outreach um, all come together. 
So what do we do? We study mold, but not the cute small mammal that you think of or clay mold, um, and definitely not the molds in your skin. Um, we study fungi. Fungi can range um, in all shapes and sizes. Um, from the bleeding tooth fungus, which you see here, um, it goes by the scientific name um, Hydnelium pechii. Um, what you're seeing here, it's, it produces a blood-like pigment um, that's also an anticoagulant. So this is a secondary metabolite that is a pigment. Um, and all the way to panel B here, which is um, the devil's finger, or um, also known as the octopus stinkhorn. It goes by the scientific name Clatteris archeri. Um, and, um, or this mushroom here that some of you may be aware of, um, Amanita muscaria, that produces hallucin hallucinogenic compounds such as mucimol. Panel A, B, and C um, are what are known as macroscopic fungi, so they are visible by the naked eye, so you can see them. You don't need a microscope. Others, um, such as the baker seas, um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, have a long history of use in food. They're also used as model organisms um, for study of um, genomics, genetics, uh, sorry, for study of molecular biology and genetics. Um, and then panel E and F here are what are known as filamentous fungi. These um, have branch-like structures. They produce spores. Um, panel E is Aspergillus flavus, which is a plant pathogen that produces the mold toxin aflatoxin. And a very closely related species, um, Aspergillus fumigatus, depending on where you are pronouncing fumigatus or fumigatus, um, is a human pathogen. So panel D, E, and F are known as microscopic fungi, where they are not visible by the naked eye. So you have to use a microscope to see them. So now that you are unlikely to forget the bleeding tooth fungus and the octopus stinkhorn, um, let's talk a little bit more about what our research group does. Our, our lab uses genomics and molecular biology to understand and characterize the association between genotype and phenotype. And what I mean by that is we're really interested in specific genetic differences or genetic sequences that are present in fungi that can result in phenotypic consequences. And you might wonder why are we interested in this? We're interested in this because by understanding the genetic differences, we can then predict or optimize phenotypic consequences. So for example, what you're seeing here is um, two, you'll read in the literature that they're claimed to be closely related species, but they actually diverged, diverged about 300 million years ago. So on your left is the Baker's yeast, Saccharomyces cerevisiae, and then on your right is Schizosaccharomyces Saccharomyces um, pombiae. Um, they, these two have been excellent model organisms for research, for fundamental research in biology. Um, from this image, you can appreciate that their morphology, morph uh, from the Latin word shape, so their morphology, what you see, um, are very different based on what we see um, in the image. And it turns out that this differences in geno genotype as well as phenotype um, give rise to their different ability to uh, ferment as well. So let's look at another example. This, um, I'm bringing back Aspergillus flavus, um, an organism that I will talk about uh, today as well. Um, Aspergillus flavus and fumigatus are two closely related species. That's again what you would hear. Um, they share about 90% genomic similarities. So that means that their genetic sequences are, in the terms, in, in fungal mycology terms, pretty, pretty similar. Um, however, Aspergillus flavus is a plant pathogen, whereas Aspergillus fumigatus is a um, human pathogen. So a lot of what we do is trying to understand why Aspergillus produces certain toxins. You know, that's how we define phenotypic consequences, something you can measure. However, why this Aspergillus fumigatus produce, uh, is a um, lung um, human pathogen, human pathogen of the lung. So um, I thought I'd share with you a little bit of my journey to alternative proteins. Um, it started with a, I would say, a serendipitous phone call in December of 2019. And um, I got a phone call um, from uh, um, the writer, uh, Larissa Zimbaroff. Some of you may um, 
have read her book. Uh, I have not gone through all of it yet, but at least I've read past the chapter chapter two on fungi. So I passed LJ and I passed um, pass fungi, okay? So um, this phone call started where Larissa, um, she, she, she said she was writing a book on future foods and she asked me, what did I think about fungi as future foods? And at that moment, um, being in academia, um, anything that sounds new and exciting, we're always like, okay, what's next, right? Um, but the more I thought about it, I, I don't think that fungi is the future. I think fungi, well, fungi is the future, but fungi has also been our past. Um, fungi ha have a long history of use in food. While it is the future, it we also have to remember that it has always been our past, right? So some of the work that we're doing now is to really try to understand how to make all the processes which we know that we've been using in the past, for example, fermentation, production of single cell proteins, production of biomass, um, what could be those game ch changer technology or processes or products or ingredients that um, that can be derived from fungi. So shortly after my first conversation with Larissa Zimbaroff, um, I was introduced to GFI by a collaborator and colleague, uh, Rob Charles at Penn State. So he, um, he shared with me about GFI. That's when I came across um, GFI's reports on um, fermentation and fermentation derived proteins. So as a food scientist, um, when I look at this framework, what do I think about? So I kind of boiled down this framework to um, on the y-axis, technology and processes. So as you go up in the y-axis, you're getting more complex um, in your technology and processes. So you need more um, to get purified ingredients here. And then on the x-axis, I kind of boiled down the x-axis to ingredients and products, where um, on the left of the x-axis, um, you get production. Some examples are production of biomass, such as mycoprotein, um, as well as all the way to where traditional fermentation, where your enzymes are still active, right? This, this framework really helped me kind of think about where I think our group can contribute in this space. Okay, so as food mycologists, we also think a lot about phylogenetic trees and how fungi are related, okay? So this is a pretty complicated, um, it's complicated when you know every single detail, but the take takeaway from this image is um, it shows you the phylogenetic distance or the genetic differences between um, the fun fungi kingdom, okay? So typically, um, they're grouped into um, two main classes, at least that's what I, um, I studied, or that's what we always talk about, basidiomycetes, um, labeled designated two here, and ascomycota designated three. Another way to look at this is something like that, which um, is what we used to use in uh, mycology. And this is another way to look at genetic relatedness of fungi. So from my understanding, most of food-associated fungi, excluding mushrooms, really come from um, Saccharomycotina, right? The Ascomycota, which is your Baker's yeast, um, your um, Schizosaccharomyces pompei, um, and then um, Eurochialis, which is where your Aspergillus, um, Aspergillus um, species come from, um, Aspergillus oryzae, Flavus, Parasiticus, and then all the way here to Mucoralis, which um, Rhizopus is part of. Um, part of this group. And rhizopus is used, um, it's also known as the tempeh mole. Um, you may have had um, tempeh, which is a cake-like uh, cake -like product that is uh, traditional to Indonesia. So the bottom line here is that there's so much more left to explore. So by the hope, my hope is that by the end of this seminar, um, I can share three stories with you today. Uh, the first one was inspired by the work that I did in my PhD on a toxic mole called Aspergillus uh, parasiticus. 
and how the sophisticated export machinery of fungi can be harnessed uh, to control synthesis of proteins as well as metabolites. And then in the second part of my talk, um, I'm going to switch gears and talk about yeast um, based on some of the work that I conducted during my postdoc at Cornell. Here we show that non-saccharomyces yeast can be used um, for production of flavor that could be used in alternative proteins, as well as um, add value to food processing byproducts. And finally, um, the last part, I will share with you some of the work that has been going on for the last year at Penn State um, with hopes that the GFI community will be our eyes and our ears um, for potential collaborations and connections, ideas, as well as suggestions. All right, so now to the story of Aspergillus. So Aspergillus parasiticus belongs to the genus Aspergillus, as you can see here in the phylogenetic tree. And alongside a lot of um, Aspergillus um, species that are safe for use in the food industry, for example, Aspergillus oryzae. So Aspergillus parasiticus and Flavus, which are toxic mold, um, are closely related based on genetic differences to um, some of our grass food associated fungi. While Aspergillus oryzae, um, so Aspergillus oryzae is known as the koji mold, so it's used in koji, um, koji making as well as um, miso fermentation. Aspergillus soy is the other one that's used in soy sauce making. Um, although these strains are not known to produce mycotoxins, um, a very closely related species, Aspergillus parasiticus, does. So what is aflatoxin? Aflatoxin is a toxic secondary metabolite. And, and the estimate is that about 4.5 billion people are uncontrollably exposed to this secondary metabolite worldwide. It is typically produced by Aspergillus flavus and parasiticus, they are major producers, and they grow and contaminate agricultural commodities such as grain, corn, peanuts, and cottonseed. From a health perspective, aflatoxin is one of the most potent naturally occurring carcinogens known, and it results in economic impact um, of millions of dollars in loss um, due to crop contamination. Um, this FDA advisory level is important, um, 20 parts per billion. This imposes a lot of burden on trade and uh, barriers in trade. Um, think about contaminated um, agricultural commodities going um, across borders. Um, so a little bit more about aflatoxin. Um, aflatoxin, the pathway, um, aflatoxin synthesis is controlled by the regulation of 25 genes or more clustered in a 75 kilobase region in the genome. So it's a pretty large um, chunk of the genome dedicated to aflatoxin production. These are the enzymes they encode. And the building blocks of aflatoxin began with acetate. And through a series of bioconversion steps, um, it leads to the production of aflatoxin. And there are four different types of um, aflatoxin, F, um, AFB1, B2, G1, and G2. And B1 is the most toxic. OK, so throughout the years, um, my work and others have shown that um, specific environmental signals, um, such as nutrient limitations, stress, light, oxidative stress, heat, um, that signal triggers down a signaling cascade and causes a downstream effect on um, transcription factors in the nucleus. This determines the ability of transcription factors to bind to promoters of aflatoxin genes. So experimental evidence suggests that ATFB and AFLR, which are two um, key players of this pathway, um, are recruited to promoters of aflatoxin genes. And that is what drives transcriptional regulation of aflatoxin. So once the aflatoxin biosynthetic cluster is turned on and aflatoxin enzymes are made, they are housed in subcellular compartments that we call aflatoxisomes. Aflatoxisomes have two fates. They can either fuse to the vacuole for protein turnover or degradation, or they can fuse to the cytoplasmic membrane for export. 
So when we think about ATFB binding and the export pathway, we really think about how we can target the export pathway to control the synthesis and export of proteins. Okay, so what my colleague, um, Dr. Anindya Chanda and I um, did was that we used two parallel approaches. We used the genetic approach where we knocked out um, two genes that are essential in the export pathway. We targeted the late endosome pathway as well as the early endosome pathway. So just to orient you a little bit, um, it's a pretty sophisticated export pathway. Um, I'm fascinated by it, but it can be a little overwhelming. So I targeted the early endosome pathway and Dr. Chanda targeted the late endosome pathway. Our hypothesis was that if we can control the export machinery of Aspergillus parasiticus, we can then also control the production of aflatoxin. So what Dr. Chanda did was he targeted AVAA, which is part of the tethering complex of the hops. Um, hops is a tethering complex that helps the late endosome fuse to the vacuole. And I targeted the early endosome complex here, VPS34. So our hypothesis is that if we block the synthesis of, block the function of this protein that is a tethering complex in the early and late endosome, we should be able to redivert and shunt aflatoxin synthesis out of the cell. And we did this two ways using the genetic approach, which is a genetic knockout. Um, basically, you remove the gene to study its function. And we also use a parallel chemical approach using small molecules. So for the late endosome, you can target the gene AVAA with sorting three, and you can target VPS34 with three methyl adenine. And what we saw um, was really interesting. Um, we now have evidence that through the genetic approach, um, which is the disruption of VPS34, um, as well as the chemical approach, we saw an increase of aflatoxin levels. So that supports that hypothesis that we had that if we block the early endosomes, we can shunt export out of the cell. And this is also com confirmed or supported by um, our chemical approach, which is using 3-methyladenine. So what you're seeing in panel A here is um, our knockout strains that I created. One example of the knockout strain where um, when you knock out VPS34, you see an increase in aflatoxin levels, which also su suggests an increase in aflatoxin export. And then in panel B is the data from 3-methyladenine where compared to the control, 3-methyladenine um, increases aflatoxin synthesis. I apologize for this multiple zeros. Um, I took the exact same image from my PhD work, and now looking back, <laughs> I would have made this figure a little different. But anyway, um, so you might wonder how is this relevant to proteins and our work on alternative proteins. So modeling after the work that Dr. Chanda and myself did, my graduate student Charlie Connolly, um, what he is doing is investigating the molecular mechanisms of export pathway in rhizopus oligospores, which is um, a food associated fungi. Um, it's a grass strain as well as Aspergillus oryzae. We are asking very similar questions with, um, with the work that we did with aflatoxin and on how, on can we target the export pathway to increase synthesis of novel prote proteins. So our hypothesis is that we can use the export machinery of fungi to precisely control synthesis of proteins and metabolites. All right, okay. So to the second part of my talk, um, we'll switch gears a little bit and talk about yeast. So based on some of the work that I conducted at Cornell during my postdoc, um, and then followed up by um, some of my graduate students and undergraduates in the lab. So here we show that non-Saccharomyces yeast, so this is not your Saccharomyces cerevisiae, the baker's yeast. So these are what I like to call them wild yeast, but they are also known as non-Saccharomyces yeast on how they can potentially produce metabolites um, that could be used in flavor um, as flavor enhancers, as well as um, to add value to um, food processing byproducts. Okay, 
So this work started um, with funding that we obtained from the Pennsylvania Wine Marketing and Research Board. Okay, so when you hear of fungi, typically a lot of them come from alcoholic beverages, come from um, lots of sugar environments, so your fruits, grapes. Um, so it's not that odd that um, what we found came from came from the vineyard. Okay, so we were interested in the diversity of fungi. So what that means, what I mean by diversity is um, the composition. So who's there and the abundance, how many of them are there. So what we did was we followed we followed fungal diversity or fungal composition and abundance throughout time across fermentation of grapes, or you can think about it as winemaking, okay? So what Henry, my graduate student here, um, did was um, he showed along with work that um, Dave Mills at UC Davis, as well as Nick Bokulich's work um, at UC Davis showed that there is a high level of fungal diversity a really sweet spot between zero to 48 hours where we see high fungal diversity. This can be seen on the y-axis here. Um, richness and evenness is a measure of who's there and how many of them are present. And it helps us understand microbial richness throughout fermentation. Okay. So Henry has since graduated and he went home to start a company in Taiwan. He um, is having fun with his bakery now. So shout out to him. I'm not sure of his year. Um, so based on Henry's work, um, then another graduate student at that time, um, Elena, she followed up and said, let's, let's isolate all these fungi. Let's see what can we get from them. Um, let's characterize them. So what Elena did was she isolated 120 fungal strains from um, the vineyard to ask if there are any strains that could contribute to flavor or different metabolites that could be used um, in the food industry. So what Elena did was she selected a couple of representatives from um, the Hansiana spora genus she selected two, Hansen Espora ovarum and Opuntiae. Um, depending on wh where in which part of the world you are, um, these were, these um, names might sound a little different to you. Um, and we isolated, we selected um, two pickier strains, Clovera and Kudra Zavi, as well as Iridiobasidium pululans as um, representative strains to characterize. So what Elena found was when she looked at metabolites, what you're looking at in this graph here are, um, are non-volatile metabolites. So these are what you would expect to find in a fermented grape sample, okay? So in purple is where the juice is. So th this is just juice, straight up juice, not fermented. And you see that most of the strains here um, produce similar core non-volatile metabolites. So these are your acids, your um, ethanol, glycerol. So that is expected, right? We see um, not a lot of diversity when you think about non-volatile compounds. What was interesting was that when Elena measured um, volatile compounds, she saw a bunch of unique compounds. And I do understand that the um, explained variance is a little low here, um, but it at least helped us give us a little um, um, screening tool to be able to say, okay, this is a strain that we're interested to pursue. So what Elena found was with the volatile compounds um, that were, um, that were um, identified in yeast, she found a bunch of different metabolites that are really interesting where the Pichia strains, so this is Pichia um, cluveri, produce um, volatile compounds that are associated with grapes, fruity, rancid butter, sweet order. So all across the board, um, the bottom line is that these yeast strains, non-saccharomyces yeast strains, are producing um, unique volatile compounds. So you, you hear terms like banana-like, fruity, um, buttery, floral, um, and even um, radish, nutty, and meaty um, descriptions. So what we're doing in the lab now is to follow up on these yeast strains. Um, I have two amazing students, Emma and Carolee, um, that are uh, USDA RU students that are here this summer. Um, what they're doing is following up on these um, non-saccharomyces yeasts. 
the way that we're doing it is that we're growing these yeasts as single strains on um, little agar um, slants that are um, placed in GC vials. So this is um, a figure that I uh, took from one of my collaborators um, here at Penn State. So the way we do it is that we inoculate, we point inoculate the yeast, different yeast strains on agar that is created at a slant. And then in real time, you can measure using a spemi fiber, you can measure um, volatiles that are emitted throughout growth of this yeast as a way then to characterize metabolites that are present. So we hope that once we characterize these yeasts, we can really pinpoint what are these nutty, buttery, meaty metabolites and where are they coming from. One question we have is that could these non-saccharomyces yeasts be used um, for flavor enhancers or as metabolites um, as we continue to innovate in the alternative protein field? Okay. So to switch gears a little bit, um, I wanted to share with you a really short story on um, Cluveromyces lactis, which I think is um, an awesome species. Um, this is a story of Cluveromyces lactis and dairy industry byproducts. So it's a pretty fun and mischievous mold. Um, Amy mentioned miraculous mold. Maybe I would change that. I think that sounds more fun now. Um, K lactose is really miraculous and mischievous because it can use lactose. Um, it's a lactose loving yeast. It can utilize lactose and convert it into um, valued products. And there's a range of products, but I'll talk about ethanol today. Um, if, if you compare K lactose to Saccharomyces cerevisiae, cerevisiae would not utilize lactose and break down lactose um, in the medium. Okay, so that's the main difference between Saccharomyces cerevisiae and lactose. Uh, K lactis with respect to uh, sugar source. Okay. So um, the United States is a global leader in cheese production, producing about 6 million metric tons of cheese per year. So turning waste into energy is a key challenge as well as an opportunity of the dairy industry. Um, because the dairy industry produces um, millions of metric tons of um, cheese, um, it also produces a byproduct of cheese processing, which is known as whey. You may also hear about it as whey permeate. So the whey permeate is a more concentrated form of whey. Whey is just whatever you see, this um, yellow liquid that's coming out of here is known as whey. Um, whey is really interesting to use because it has really high lactose content. Of course, the, the range of lactose varies depending on which, which industry you go and um, collect from. But on average, it's about 80% of lactose that's coming out of whey. So one of the questions that we had was, can we utilize um, whey that's coming out from cheese processing and add value to a byproduct of the cheese um, industry? As I mentioned, lactose is a major product of whey. Um, and just to give you an idea, for every pound of cheese produced, nine pounds of whey is generated. Okay, so that's a lot. So almost 90% of milk um, comes out as, as whey. So I think we can do better here. Um, so one of the significant challenge here is to utilize whey as a substrate for downstream to add value to the high lactose as well as low pH that comes out of whey. And um, just little statistics here for those of you that are interested, um, based on these estimates, if the total output of cheese in the United States is about 13 billion pounds, more than 100 billion pounds of whey um, may be generated here. So a lot of, um, a lot of byproducts to work with. So we asked a really simple question here again, can fungi use substrates from whey to grow and produce biomass? Um, I mentioned earlier, um, one of the significant challenge of whey is um, its high levels of la lactose and low pH. Um, and I also mentioned earlier that Saccharomyces cerevisiae can break down glucose well, but unable to ferment lactose. So we turn to um, uh, a yeast that Cloveromyces lactis that I mentioned that was originally actually found in the dairy environment that is able to break down lactose. And from that, from research of others, we know now that um, the presence of two genes, lac 12 and lac 4, um, give rise to their ability to uh, break down lactose. 
Okay, so what we did was we used K-lactis and we asked the question, if we took whey permeates, so these are, whey permeates are more concentrated form of whey, we asked a simple question, can K-lactis grow and produce biomass? So what you're seeing here in panel A is just really simple measurement of OD. Um, YPD in red is a standard lab medium, as well as 10% whey permeate and 20% whey permeate. So based on panel A, we see that, um, if anything, K lactis is growing um, equal or um, better in some cases than our standard um, YPD medium. And we also use another strain, WLP650, which I believe is a Britannomyces strain that's used in beer production. Um, and we see similar um, take, -home, um, take home observations where. Um, YPD is the standard lab medium, and we see 20% um, and 10% supporting the growth of others, other yeast as well, such as Britannomyces. And okay, so growth is good. Um, what else can we measure as an indicator of these yeast being able to add value to these byproducts? So one, one way to measure um, the ability to use lactose is the production of ethanol. This is a simple kind of end product that we can measure to make sure that our process, our strains are working as well as um, our ways being, um, our lactose and ways being utilized. So what you're seeing here is um, some data from our lab that shows that our starting amount of, of lactose is pretty high, about 60 grams per liter. Um, the fermentation or the um, growth here is not fully complete. So by the end of 90, um, by the end of um, 96 hours, not all of the lactose is utilized. So we didn't, we didn't run the fermentation to completion. Um, however, we also see production of ethanol. So um, WLP650 produced about 2.5 to 2.75 um, in K-lactis. Um, so about 2.5% um, ethanol, um, suggesting that K-lactis and WLP650 can utilize the lactose that is present in whey and convert it to ethanol, okay? So we did the same thing from fresh whey that's coming out of our cheese making downstairs in the creamery. And we saw similar things where we start off with a lactose um, content of about 50 grams per liter. And then this one we ran to completion for the whey. And we see that lactose is non-detectable at the end of 96 hours um, and ethanol is produced about again 2.5 to 3 percent. Okay, so where do we go with our whey story? Um, our next step with the whey project is now to use a filamentous fungi, uh, Trichoderma raisii. We don't know yet if this is the perfect strain to use. Um, it's also known as Hippocrea. Um, um, Jacarina, depending on whether you look at its sexual state or asexual state, um, on the ability of trichoderma to utilize um, lactose for the production of biomass. Okay, so I'm gonna just quickly check on my time here. Um, so in this last part of the seminar, um, I just would like to share with you two projects that are going on at Penn State. Um, in hopes that um, we can open it as a platform for suggestions and ideas um, as well as collaborations. So shortly after my call with Larissa Zimbarov, um, I started reading um, literature on the current protein sources, animal dependent meat production, as well as the environmental impact of food production. So one of the um, one of the articles that stood out to me, um, it was it was really an aha moment for me, um, is this 2019 report um, from Nature and a call to eat less meat. So as I as I kind of read through this article, um, it's clear that our current meat production is unsta unsustainable and inefficient. Um, it's a key driver of climate change as this, this article points out. And depending on where you go in the literature, you would hear all kinds of different associations with env environmental degradation, um, zoonotic diseases, anti antibiotic resistance, which I, I don't think is, is unfamiliar to the audience here today. Um, this graph to me really stood out. Um, the bottom line here in this graph is basically asking the question, what if people ate less meat? And to me, um, my interpretation of this graph is that no matter how 
much you decrease meat consumption, whether you don't take any, any animal source food, all the way down to a moderate consumption of meat, the bottom line is that you can make an impact on at least what they're measuring in this study, greenhouse gas um, mitigation. Okay, so to me, that was a call to to ask the question, can we do better with all our alternative protein sources. Um, and this brings me to cell ag, which I also think is not an unfamiliar term, but for those um, of you that are unfamiliar with cell, cellular agriculture, especially students that are in the audience, um, how does cellular agriculture work? Um, typically in cell ag, at least my understanding of cell ag is a small sample of cells are taken from the animal and then it goes through a very simplified in this diagram phase of cell proliferation and tissue um, tissue perfusion. Ultimately, um, the cell of cell egg is a final product that looks and tastes like meat. Um, you might hear um, some terms called scaffolding here. These, um, these cells, the bovine uh, muscle cells are adherent cells, so they need um, a scaffold material so that they can grow on. Um, so there's a lot of interest in the, in the area of cellular agriculture. And some of, some of the work that I'm going to share with you also um, is inspired by one of um, my collaborators, as well as um, mentor Glenn, uh, Dr. Glenn Gaudet, um, who's now at Boston College. And I'm sure his work is very familiar to you now on the use of decellarized spinach scaffolds uh, for muscle cells. So we are not a tissue engineering lab, um, but we think our expertise in fruit mycology and fungi can help here. So my students like to joke that we are the fun guys. Um, everyone wants to work with us. Um, so what we think we, we can do here is that fungal mycelium, um, which you can see here, um, it's kind of this root-like structures. They're microscopic, so you can see them um, under the microscope. We think that these fungal mycelium can be used as scaffolds for a cultivated meat. So which is where this year we submitted our first GFI grant. It was not funded, but it's still good. Um, we submitted one on scaffolding material and although the grant was not funded, we received really good feedback from the reviewers and one of them actually led me to um, another chance collaboration with Dr. Um, Jung Kyo Kim at Michigan State University. So we just submitted our um, USDA NIFA proposal to the Novel Foods Manufacturing um, Group, um, JK, um, uh, Junkyo, Dr. Kim goes by JK. Um, so what, um, what JK's expertise is in is really um, understanding how to characterize bovine cells. So he, um, his training, his background is in animal science. So what we're doing together is combining our expertise in um, fungal biology using different um, variants of uh, fungi optimized for specific um, nutrients, substrates, as well as characterizing these scaffolds for use in um, primary cells. So we're trying both bovine cells as uh, bovine muscle cells as well as fat cells at adipocytes. Um, and um, some of the preliminary data that we have generated together, um, panel A shows you a little piece of the mycelium that we've generated. Panel B and C um, shows you different um, architecture of my mycelium. So what you're seeing here is mycelium grown under two different sources of substrates. Um, and as we can see, the, the um, morphology or the architecture of the mycelium is quite different. And we think that these substrates can then um, alter the structure of um, mycelium when we um, use them as scaffolding material. And panel D and E is just um, JK's really wonderful images. Um, panel D is on um, muscle cells. So JK is an expert in characterizing them. And panel E is on adipocytes, um, characterization of adipocytes as good indicators of um, primary cell development. Um, and today I'll end with um, another um, opportunity that we're working on together with my colleagues, Dr. Hopfer, Dr. Kelly, and Dr. Uh, Greg Ziegler here at Penn State. So um, while we hear a lot of um, advances in science and technology and how they have enabled acceleration of um, future foods, the current challenge is really still how to engage and empower uh, consumers to make um, choices that are 
so complex that are intertwined with equity, inclusion, economic prosperity, um, as well as technologies that are of local, regional, as well as um, national scale. So what we hope that the seed grant that we're putting into IFT would do is that we're trying to investigate consumer preferences as well as engage consumers on the interaction of texture and, um, and consumer preferences. And we hope that the outcomes from this grant would, would really inform and guide the alternative protein industry, which the last I checked was um, projected to reach 27 billion by 2027. So um, in summary, I hope that um, today you have learned a little bit more about fantastic fungi and mischievous or miraculous mole and how they can contribute to advancing um, the science and technology of alternative proteins. In the first part of my talk, I shared with you about how we think that we can use the fungal export machinery um, to precisely control synthesis um, and export of proteins as well as metabolites to increase production yields. And then the second part of my talk, um, I shared about non-saccharomyces yeast and how they can contribute to production of flavor metabolites, flavor associated metabolites, as well as be used um, to add value to dairy um, or um, food processing byproducts. And finally, I shared with you some work um, that has been going on at Penn State for the last year. And I hope that you um, enjoyed uh, and learned something about uh, fantastic fungi. And I couldn't have done all of this without my collaborators um, and my wonderful students. And I also acknowledge funding sources as well as collaborators that I always reach out to them asking for a letter of support and they've always um, accommodated my requests. So with that, um, I would love to take any questions or any suggestions or feedback that you have um, for students that are in the audience as well, um, please always ask your question. Don't, don't let it pass. Um, with that, Amy, I'll turn it back to you, I believe. Yes, thank you so much, Joe. This is a fantastic seminar. Um, thank you, Amy. Really, yeah, really, really exciting to hear about the way that fungi and molds impact production yields, help us create um, better, more precise ingredients and functionality and also love the, the ongoing research around cultivated meat scaffolding. So thank you for this really helpful, broad framework from which to view the role that fermentation or um, fungi and molds rather can play in, um, in the alternative protein field. Thank you, Amy. Um, mm -hmm. Um, to our audience members, um, please feel free if you haven't already to drop into the Q&A section and add in the questions that you have for Dr. Wee today. Um, I will kick it off with a question from Priscilla. Um, first, thank you so much for an informative presentation. Um, what are the interesting characteristics they've seen in some filamentous fungi are the colorant capacity generated by secondary metabolites? Um, which would be a huge plus in alternative protein production for the red pigment, for example, um, if it's just part of the growth. So what are your thoughts on, on the usefulness of this function? Um, are your studies taking that into consideration as you select the right kinds of strains to work with? Yeah, thank you, Priscilla. Thank you for that question. Um, we're not looking at pigments at the moment, but just based on understanding the phylogenetic differences of fungi, um, one mushroom that I grew up eating in Southeast Asia um, is, is basically the entire fruiting body is red and it actually tastes um, kind of fishy, so like seafood. So to Priscilla's point, I think that there is a lot of opportunities with pigments, as we know now with impossible, at least like the, the heme is produced by um, yeast, right? It's, it's um, genetically produced by yeast. So, um, you know, we are a lab that we embrace everything all the way from natural variants to um, engineering of different strains to optimize production. I think there is a space for everyone. Um, and as we talk about and communicate about different ways in which we can get pigments, so as you mentioned, Priscilla, that would be considered natural pigments. I think people like to hear about that. But um, in nature, most times these pigments are not produced um, in large quantities. So as we innovate or find new strains, um, we have to keep in mind that um, 
the, the natural habitat of these um, fungi would not actually favor large amounts of pigments, for example, per se. I hope that answers your question or at least provides some insights on how I think about pigments and fungi. Yeah, that's super helpful. Thank you, Joe. Um, here's a question from Ben. Um, super great to see you, fantastic talk. Um, um, they're asking whether you can comment, comment on issues of coordinating fungal cell growth and bovine cell growth in the co-culture model. Um, mm -hmm. so fungal and mammalian cells both have very different culture requirements. So it seems like getting them to grow in a cooperative manner might actually be the grand challenge of using fungi as scaffolds. Ultimately. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ben. Thank you for that question. So for now, we are using um, fungal scaffolds that are inert. What I mean by that is they're not actively growing. Um, and it just, for now, we just want to characterize the 3D structure of the scaffolding and the ability, the compatibility um, to grow, to ad uh, adhere bovine uh, muscle cell as well as adipocytes. And even now we're not even doing them together. We want to not miss anything. We want to kind of go down to the basics and just ask a simple question. My, based on what we're seeing, at, at least at the fungal level, um, JK might be, might disagree with me. Um, I, I told him that I will send all the, all the <laughs> animal signs and bovine cell questions to him. But um, what we're seeing now is that if we look at the molecular level of what mycelium is, it's chitin and glucans and they're polysaccharides. So we don't, believe that these, uh, so maybe a more positive tone, we believe that these will be compatible if we look at inert. So these are not actively growing fungi. Ben, I hope that that helps a little bit um, um, with that perspective or that question. Thanks, Joe. Here's a related question sure. um, from Salil. Um, there's some curiosity about whether bovine cells preferentially attach to mycelium scaffolds or if any other treatment or modifications are needed um, to be performed in order to optimize that cell culture attachment. Yeah, we don't know yet. We know based on micro microscopy evidence, right? So, so I do the material side and JK does the animal science side, but based on how we're seeing our mycelium structures, they are quite different under, for example, if you use scanning electron microscope, you can alter substrates and you can see very different um, 3D filaments, um, 3D uh, mycelium um, structures. Um, and the second part of the question was, are there any optimizations that can be done? For now, no, but I also know that there are very specific genes that um, affect branching of uh, mycelium. So if we understand the function of those genes, then we can can optimize um, the molecular mechanisms that would um, help with a certain type of texture or certain types of structure. Um, I hope that that helps a little bit. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, can you speak a little bit to the advantages that fungi-based scaffolds have over other platforms that the field is exploring, like plant-based scaffolds? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question and one that I am still pondering on. So one of the papers that I read is really in the architecture field and um, I don't have the paper in front of me now, but um, it really shows like the price breaking point, the cost of mycelium based material, as well as comparing it to other um, material. And based on that, I, I think the, the article is called something like um, mycelium composites uh, for use in um, fabrication and tuning or something like that. And based on the price point, at least my interpretation of that graph is mycelium material outweighs or like is so much more cost efficient than other materials that biomaterials that were compared with. So from my perspective, I think a biomaterial like um, fungi, like fun fungal mycelium can be easily grown. Um, you could even look at um, growing it on not just liquid fermentation, but solid fermentation. So we think about optimization of fermentation a lot. And one of the advantage also of using fungal mycelium is uh, their ability to really tolerate um, all kinds of um, different fermentation capacity. Um, so from a fermentation point of view, as well as a cost point of view, um, that is how I convince myself at least on, on why I should pursue um, fungal mycelium. I hope that helps. Yeah, that absolutely helps. Um, 
Very exciting. Um, I think, yeah, the kind of cost and sheer efficiency benefits of mycelium um, alone probably justify this exploration. Um, do you have um, any examples of others who have successfully manipulated fungal protein export machinery for a food production or a food protein application? I can't think of any at this point. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'm not sure who asked the question, but if they have any thoughts or, um, or, or any reasons as to why we shouldn't pursue the export mechanism, <laughs> um, I would want to know um, earlier than later. Um, but no, I actually do not um, know of any um, at the top of my head now. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, on the material science side for mm -hmm. the use of mycelium scaffolding um, for cultivated meat, do you know how tunable the porosity of mycelium is as a scaffold? So if we look at the whole cut meat application, we're expecting some pretty dense cell culture that's expected there. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible to use mycelium to implement media and gas um, exchange for a prolonged culture period? Yeah, yeah. So that was part of the, the question was part of my answer. So a combination of a gas fermentation and solid state fermentation could be used to achieve porosity. Although I haven't seen one um, that actually is used currently, or um, maybe I'm just, you know, I, I didn't dig into the literature enough. Um, and I, I went through a bunch of different patents on mycelium and I'm still going through them. But um, I think bottom line with porosity is um, that's something that we're also thinking about. And from my understanding on branching and porosity of 3D um, texture of mycelium, it heavily is dependent on culture conditions as well as um, the substrate that's in. So not just the type like gas versus solid, it's also the types of sugars that are used or types of nutrients that are present. Sounds great, thank you, Joe. Um, do you have any um, thoughts about the opportunity to produce flavor metabolites using mycelium scaffolds for cellular agriculture? Um, so do you think oh, there's okay. an opportunity, yeah, to use mycelium via fermentation to enhance hmm. the flavor of cultivated meat? Yeah, you know, that is a really interesting thought. So so as the mycelium is growing, it's producing flavor metabolites. I, I think that's what the question asked. Um, I have not thought about that association, but one thing that I was talking about with JK is um, the ability to produce, let's say, um, anti-microbial anti, um, compounds that as the fun fungi is growing, um, it is eliminating or um, keeping the culture um, relatively um, with food. We can't say sterile, sterile relative to drug, you know, pharma production. So I think with scale up of um, scale up of fungal mycelium or any fungi, especially for food applications, um, we need to be a little smart about the way we think about a, a cheaper or low cost way. So one of the things that we, I have not pursued it, but are thinking about is um, as the fungal mycelium is growing, could it also be producing metabolites that can inhibit bacterial growth, for example, or keep the culture medium um, relatively clean? Yeah. Yeah, those are some great considerations. Um, what is your perspective on the use of a consortia of microorganisms, a microbial consortia versus using just a single species um, with this method? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a really interesting question. And, and I think I would answer this question differently if I was in the US versus anywhere else in the world. Um, <laughs> And, and I don't have a, a great answer for this, but my mind um, defaults to sort of this free market idea, right? Technology and the use of diverse strains. Um, every strain has a um, advantage to use versus another. Um, and I think that for certain parts of the world where the strain is native to that part of the world, it could be an economic potential to use. So, um, I think it's a, a bit of a trade-off because with a single strain, you can go through the whole like regulatory and safety approval process. You go through the grass, you have a long history of use, but at the same time, you're missing all the other, um, that crazy phylogenetic tree that I shared with you. So much is left um, unexplored. 
So I really think it boils down to the technology and processes as well as the product and ingredient. Um, I, yeah, very broad answer. I, unfortunately, I apologize. Um, no worries. I think that was still very helpful. Um, there's a question here from Christoph, um, and you touched on it a little bit uh, over mm -hmm. the course of your presentation, but can you talk a bit more about the potential of utilizing agricultural or food processing waste streams as raw materials for the fermentation process? Um, basically, this um, valorization of waste streams. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christoph. Um, I, I think there's a lot of work um, all across the globe going on on using um, byproducts for um, that's coming out from our food processing as well as agricultural production. Um, one that stands out to me um, is a group I believe in the Netherlands um, that's using stale bread um, in a continuous um, fermenter, and um, I think they're using fasarium. I'm I know it's a filamentous fungi. So they're using stale bread, bread as a, a substrate and adding um, filamentous fungi and producing um, patties out of them. Um, so my thoughts on um, uh, byproducts from the food industry, it, it depends where it's coming from. And what I would be at least a little you know, cautious about is the accumulation of anti-nutritionals or any heavy metals, for example, like um, we toyed around with the idea of using coffee, for example, or, you know, um, spent grains as well. I think there is a lot of potential there, but we want to be able to profile um, based from a toxicological perspective, what is accumulating in these, um, in these um, waste, if that makes sense. Thank you. Um, there is a quick question here from Deborah. Um, the acceleration of protein export, um, this method is, is pretty fascinating. Um, so what is your, um, I guess, what is your perspective on the uh, likelihood that applying such a mechanism could increase the volume and scalability of the production specifically of novel plant-based proteins. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we don't, based on, so we don't have any data from our lab to support that, but um, an example that I can point you to is um, Pichia pastoris that can, um, in the past, like um, the production yield is up to 10 grams per liter, which is much higher, five, five-fold higher than one to two grams per liter, for example, in E. coli or Saccharomyces cerevisiae. So there are strains that, for example, Pichia pastoris is the name of the, the yeast that I'm thinking of. And one of its main uh, phenotypic strengths is its ability to tolerate really high cell densities. So, so starting with something like Pichia pastoris and targeting export machinery might be a way to, to, to increase even further production yield. Um, although it's it's hard, right? I know we always want more, but um, at the same time, I think we should be respectful of our microbial factories as well. <laughs> if, if they are our farms of our future, right? We, we need to understand fully at what cost are we increasing production at. Yeah, do you anticipate there being any challenges to further scaling mycelia as an alt protein matrix. Um, I know that one of the, the benefits is, is its scalability. It's demonstrated mm -hmm. scalability within the food yeah. industry already. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, do you anticipate there being any regulatory or scale up challenges? Not with the strains that are mm -hmm. um, grass. I, you know, that's a very simple question, answer that I, I default to. Um, I don't think, based on a regulatory perspective, um, from a scientific and te technology perspective, um, I have some thoughts, but maybe I'll save that for another day. Um, yeah, on, but from a regulatory perspective, if you're using a grass strain, at least from my understanding of reading all the patents that are out there on all of our collaborators and supporters that are out in industry, industry partners as well, um, 
a lot of um, a lot of companies are using grass strains or um, very closely related strains. So, for example, Nature's Fine is using a fusarium um, fusarium strain that is new, right? Um, they they're calling it new to the world strain, new to the world protein. Um, I believe they're they're going through um, that kind of regulatory questions as well, right? On safety, um, mycotoxin production would be one that I um, would be concerned about. Um, but as we saw with the example of phy phylogenetic difference between Aspergillus and, and Aspergillus oryzae and Aspergillus flavus, they're so close together, but oryzae does not have the toxin cluster, whereas um, flavus has it. So um, I think I think over time, um, we the regulatory approval. I, I can't speak for the regulators, but I would hope that um, that tech and processes would meet at some point with regulations. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Nature's Fine did receive grass no questions letter from the FDA recently, which mm -hmm. was very very cool to see. And I just dropped a link to any of of uh, those of you in, in the community who are interested. Oh, cool! In more about Thank that. you for sharing, Amy. Yeah, absolutely. I think that was a really exciting development. Um, very cool. Well, we just have a few questions left. Um, sure. It reminds me of my PhD defense all over again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're issuing a <laughs> Um, Here's a question from Peter. Um, how, like, what methods do you use to render your fungal scaffolds inert? And how do you think the choice of a process that you're using might change both the three-dimensional structure and the surface proteins to which the bovine cells attach to? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Peter. That's that's an excellent question, which we're trying different ways now. So one way is using heat. So that is, you know, people have done it before. It's not new, but different levels of heat, right? Um, the problem with these treatments, so heat is one that we've tried. Um, a wash, a ethanol wash is another, but those are, in my mind, not feasible or practical for use in the food industry, right? Um, and I think there is a lot of trade-offs there where um, heat might be denaturing proteins. So then are you, are you enhancing structure at at the compromise of nutritional value. So as we as we try these different var variables, which we're thinking about texture, nutritional value, um, protein degradation, um, for now we're trying the really simple like heat and, and ethanol, <laughs> ethanol wash or PBS, ethanol PBS wash. Um, but yeah, if, if there are any other um, methods that I'm currently not thinking about that um, can can preserve texture, three D structure, as well as protect nutritional um, like protein levels. Um, I would love to talk. Awesome. Um, if you, Joe, would like to take a look through the remaining questions and see if there are any that call out to you, um, feel free to do. Sure. That. Yeah. Um, there are. There's a question here. Um, about your whey system with K. lactis and T. Mm -hmm. rutei, um, whether they're fermented sim simultaneously or sequentially. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Some of these are rapid fire questions. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, we are. Um, so when you look into the fermentation literature, um, especially production of biomass as well as um, ethanol to add value, um, there are. Um, monoculture versus uh, co-culturing or hetero, you know, multiple strains in a culture. There is also um, co-inoculation as well, as well as sequential inoculation. And this is not new. Um, it's done in wine and alcoholic beverages where um, they would usually grow a non-saccharomyces yeast and produce all of these flavor, wonderful flavor compounds. And then after 24 to 48 hours um, at Saccharomyces cerevisia. So that's a sequential inoculation. Um, for now, we're, we have not tried that with yeast, uh, with whey at least, because we still don't know so much about the whey system um, we also want to test different way that is coming out of different cheese making processes. So we're not there yet, but uh, we're doing co-culturing and sequential co uh, sequential culturing in our alcoholic <laughs> beverage um, system. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. I'm gonna look through questions here. Um, 
I see um, a lot of familiar names. Thank you so much for your time and for all the questions. Um, let me look through. Amy, are you are you seeing any that we have not addressed? Yeah. Um, um, I, there is a, a, a question here from David. Um, mm -hmm. I've dismissed most of the ones that we've addressed. Um, but there's a question here from David about whether you've seen any developments um, to create multifunctional strains um, in already scaled fungal fermentation systems like mm. citric acid production that could produce a precision product whose biomass would be further utilized for food or feed. Hmm. Yeah, I'm reading David's question as as you're reading that, Amy. I I have not seen. I I think citric acid is is a great example of a process that has been so optimized that I I think we kind of look over right with citric acid production um, that could produce a precision product like biomass for mycoprotein, for example, multifunctional strains. Um, I'm not sure if that means like multi like genetically like genetically modified recombinant like multifunctional strains if that's my understanding um no i've not seen it i think i think for food application we're constantly on this like paradigm of like do we go recombinant or do we go natural variant right um, um i have not seen multi multifunctional strains at least from my understanding of what that term means um Sorry, David, I'm, I'm happy to chat more if that that um, response is not satisfactory to you. Um, I'm always, always interested. Um, also, yeah, I want to shout out to industry partners. If you know any anyone sparks this sparks any um, ideas, uh, we would always love to talk and welcome anyone. Yeah, it looks like David offered up a clarification for what he means by multifunctional. Mm -hmm. um, he means capable of making kind of a precision product um like a mm -hmm. ingredient or enzyme and then also be used to produce yeah biomass yeah thank you david for that clarification I, I think this idea is similar to the one asked about um uh flavor or pigments um and um antimicrobial uh antimicrobials as well right can you simultaneously grow um, a mass of mycelium at the same time that mycelium is either producing enzymes or metabolites that are um, that are um, targeting either flavor or um, or um, what was David talking about? Sorry, I'm like super hungry. <laughs> so anyway, um, flavor and enzymes, right? So can you can you harvest biomass at the same time also have these enzymes? I think so, and and the design really is on the bioreactor, right? Designing bioreactor and fermentation um, environments that can support the growth of both biomass, that multifunctional um, perspective that David had. Absolutely, yeah. And I and I think that that's sort of that game changer vision, right? For, for the next uh, five to 10 years um, with um, using fungal biomass as well as precision fermentation products. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Joe. Um, there's a question here from Shital. Um, can you yeah. comment if the edible fungi um, encodes toxin genes that aren't normally expressed and mm -hmm. um, on whether growing conditions for the fungi affects the toxin production? Yeah, thank you, Shital, for that question. Um, so for, for Aspergillus oryzae, which is the koji mole and the one used for, uh, and Aspergillus soy um, used in soy sauce, the, the gene cluster is absent. So um, aflatoxin biosynthesis is really interesting where with the Flavus and Parasiticus, that entire region is preserved throughout evolution, presumably to help with some defense mechanism for the fungi. So for other edible fungi like Aspergillus oryzae, um, that cluster is, is not present. However, there are other fungi, I wouldn't call them edible fungi per se, um, that the clusters are silence. And um, I, I think that is a risk, right? If, if so, the absence of the toxin does not mean that the genes are not present and that there wouldn't be a condition where um, they would produce the toxins. But, based on laboratory conditions, as well as the cultivation media that we know, um, 
we know a lot about controlling these mycotoxins that are extremely dangerous. So um, that is where tying back to the other question where single strain versus a diverse strain, um, it's that idea again, right? With the single strain, you can afford to do so much more with it that you know um, so much about its background, its safety, its um, biology. Thank you so much, Joe. Um, shifting gears a little bit to thinking sure. about um, less uh, technological hurdles and considerations, perhaps, mm -hmm. and, and more about the consumer perception. Mm -hmm. um, so what do you think the biggest challenges are for meat eating consumers to accept these kinds of um, non-animal derived alternative protein sources? Um, mm -hmm. And how does your research plan to close that gap? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Amy, for that question. And um, I, I'm not a sensory and consumer scientist, but from all the conversations and a lot of heated arguments that we've we've had or heated discussions, um, we talked about this idea of uh, consumer engagement, right, rather than consumer acceptance. Um, my husband is a meat eater. He loves his bacon sizzling on the grill, right? He, I mean, it's hard to, it's really hard to say like, hey, instead of bacon, can you consider this? I just don't tell him and serve it. <laughs> it's like, you know, um, and, and I think over time working with culinary experts um, as well as um, another, another aha moment for me was my little one, my four-year-old, no, my two-year-old, um, she has a dairy uh, allergy. And I, we've been giving her either soy or almond milk, right? And when almond beverage, okay. <laughs> so, um, so, and she would say, oh, mom, that's almond milk, you know? So she would grow up with the idea that there are these non-dairy alternatives and the dairy milk vocabulary is absent from her diet, right? So I think targeting like working with culinary experts as well as the young, right? Like moms, especially um, school programs. Um, there was so much we can do from the consumer angle to, to really um, advance the field of consumer and sensory science. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense that kind of socializing these technologies early on with the future consumer base, at least the backbone mm -hmm. of the future consumer base will go a exactly. long way. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think, you know, lots of consumer studies have shown that taste, price, and convenience are the factors by which consumers make their dietary choices and their, um, the, the, make the choice of, of what products to purchase. Um, mm -hmm. So mycelium, your research insofar as it advances texture and taste and cost mm -hmm. um, are certainly, you know, um, helping close that consumer acceptance gap. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I wanted to ask just one last question. Sure, to wrap of course. Up today. Yeah. Um, thank you for being so generous with your time. No worries. Um, my stomach is rumbling. Hopefully no one's hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> We're okay. <laughs> Not a hearing. Mine is right there with yours. Um, the question is, um, you know, we are, we're at just the beginning of this, um, the onset of this field. Um, and so there are lots of um, students in the audience who are thinking about how they can position themselves to do alternative protein research uh, for labs like yours. For, um, mm -hmm. And so I, I'm wondering if you have any career advice for uh, students, maybe early in career scientists in our community today um, in how to explore pathways into the alternative protein field. Yeah, yeah. So thinking about thinking back on my my experience as a grad student, um, you know this 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 feeling where you feel like nervous at the same time as well as excited. Um, and just kind of a shout out to graduate students that those feelings can coexist together. So for example, if you wanna ask a question at a presentation or reach out to a professor that's working in the field, you might feel this really crazy, like intense emotions of like excitement as well as like complete fear, right? Ter terrified. Um, just know that it never gets old, right? If something um, spurs your excitement, um, that you are passionate about it, just ask and just ask. And the worst thing that can happen is that they say no. But if you don't ask, you would forever hold that silence, right? Um, 
so students that are in the alternative protein that are interested in the alternative protein industry, GFI is a great platform as well. I know, um, Amy, you have a wonderful program, the Alt Protein Project. Um, for those of you that students that are interested, um, uh, as we see the alternative protein science and technology and research and education expanding across the US, um, there will be programs available for students, for example, um, pipelining all the way from REU, so undergraduate research that's going on. So my students in the lab now work, get to work in these fields, graduate level as well, um, from all across different um, funding sources, postdoctoral fellowship level as well. I know, um, for example, the Swiss um, initiative Future Food Institute or Future Food Initiatives that is um, a collaboration between Nestle, Jevedan and Bühler and um, I think it's um, Zurich, I think ETL Zurich. I think that is a wonderful idea to really pipeline all throughout um, all across the globe and all throughout um, stages of career as well. Mm -hmm. Thanks Joe. Yeah, yeah. definitely we have loads of resources on GFI's website for those of you who are interested in exploring some of these pathways and seeing um, how to start finding collaborators and, um, and faculty members who would want to work with you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time today to share the, the innards of your research. It's been so cool to hear about how you uh, bridge connections across, um, across all of these different fields. Thank you, Amy. Um, there, yeah, the chat was blowing up with um, lots of praise, high praise for um, how useful this presentation has been already for folks thinking about similar questions. Um, uh, before we wrap up today, do you have any last thoughts that you'd like to leave our community with before we wrap up and bid adieu? Yeah, I, I think just connecting by GFI and LinkedIn. I think LinkedIn is a great platform. I've been following a lot of what the alternative protein space is doing. Um, Food Navigator USA like posts a, a lot on LinkedIn. Um, I've um, over the last two weeks been able to connect with people in the industry via LinkedIn. I, I think it's kind of a low barrier, right? You think about uh, reaching out, um, it's, it's an easy space to reach out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So don't be afraid to knock on doors, I guess is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Wee. Thank you to all of our community members who've joined from all over the globe. Um, if you haven't joined our community already, check out gfi.org slash community for details on how to join to stay in the loop on future seminars. And we look forward to seeing you all again next month um, and in September at the Good Food Conference. Thanks so much, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Wee. Thank you, Amy. Thank you, everyone, for your time. Have a great day.